Kalimera. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the annual event of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung here in Thessaloniki. Uh, welcome not only in the room, but welcome also to wherever you're watching the live stream from, as the event is live streamed uh, all over the globe and will be also available on demand afterwards. As I said, this is the annual event of uh, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung office here in Thessaloniki. I'm the office director, Michalis Goudis, and I welcome you here uh, in Thessaloniki. This year, we decided to dedicate our annual event, uh, an international congress, to the issue of migration and asylum. We try to invite everyone participating in it to rethink migration and asylum in Europe. But it's not uh, an event about migration and asylum per se. It's an occasion to use use these topics, of course, to expand our discussion and actually check out the state of democracy. Uh, in Europe, um, there are a number of challenges I don't need to explain to an audience like you uh, when it comes to migration and asylum in Europe. Uh, all the latest policy developments are definitely alarming, at least us here in the room. And we cannot have more optimism after the latest European election results, but this is definitely something we will be discussing uh, in this panel. This is the second day of the International Congress. Uh, we started already yesterday. Quick link to yesterday. Um, we had a round of uh, six thematic workshops uh, with the participants here. Uh, in Thessaloniki, uh, there will be different types of reports, so you will be having uh, later on the chance uh, from the, the ones you missed to, to hear what has been discussed, what are the main takeaways. Um, and also there are things that will be happening after this conference today, not just in the, in the course of the day, but there is also this photo exhibition that we inaugurated yesterday in TOS Gallery. I definitely encourage everyone, uh, even the ones watching and who will be coming in Thessaloniki until the end of the month, to visit TOS Gallery and uh, check out this exhibition, Thousand Dreams, where you see uh, stories, the personal stories, the personal experiences of LGBTIQ refugees in their struggle to reach uh, our territories. Now, housekeeping points uh, before we start. Um, I think it's important, although again, for, for this setting, I don't think I need to, to say it, but still, uh, the, the, the point is that we all have an open and very respectful conversation and to be as interactive as possible. So you will have the chance to participate actively throughout uh, the session, both now and in the second one. And there are two ways to do that. Obviously, the one is to take the floor. There will be a rowing mic that you can use and ask your question or share your view. Please keep it short. Um, it's, uh, we didn't do a good start because we were a bit late, but we will really try to stick to time because, as I said, live streaming and on demand really requires us to be on time. But the second thing that uh, we give you as an option is to use Mentimeter, an online polling tool. And it's quite easy, and actually we can even test it uh, right now, what Mentimeter looks like. Um, with a question that you will be able to see on the screen uh, in a moment. Uh, as you see here, and this is why I have this uh, very uh, sophisticated mic so that I can stand up, uh, we have this uh, site. You see the, the instructions on the screen, joinmenti.com. So you go on your browser, on your mobile phone. Uh, you can already use the Wi-Fi. You, you see the code both here and outside the room. And once you hit menti.com, you use the code you see, so in that case, 57128288, and then you see the, the question on your mobile phone screen. Uh, in order to test it and to warm up a bit, we ask you the simple question, where you arrived from uh, in Thessaloniki. So we start with Lesvos, Bilbao, Berlin, Vienna, Athens, Amsterdam, Brussels, and you see, it's, it's getting prettier and prettier, the more diverse, Paris, Budapest, it's, uh, yeah, Aarhus, Prague, so yeah, it's, uh, it, we were quite sure it's a very diverse crowd, so it's uh, also a safe bet to show that this is indeed uh, having people from all over Europe, uh, and well beyond in some cases, Cologne, Bologna. So yeah, 
The main point is that you actually see how this tool works, Sarajevo, uh, and so on and so forth. Please keep using this tool, and of Istanbul, of course, and of course, over the course of the discussion, there will be of course, questions that have to do with the issues that we will be addressing. Getting into the panel so that we can finally start um, our conversation, um, you see the, in the title, maybe in the program, you definitely have one of these in, in your bags. We uh, gave the title to this discussion, Democracy Under Pressure, Rule of Law Challenged, and Europe's uh, Shift to the Right. Um, the way we deal with migration, and this is also a bit of a personal comment, I think the way we deal with migration, the way we approach the other, with a capital O, I think is um, our fellow human beings in the end of the day is the absolute mirror of our values and it's not a distorting mirror. So it's a, a look, even a look at uh, one country's migration policies or even a region's migration policies as the EU uh, in our case uh, is something of a litmus test for the state of democracy um, in, the state, in the same place. And this is also the tone uh, we would like to give to this conversation to expand our scope and to actually address this question, the different ways in which democracy is under pressure in Europe at the moment, how the rule of law is challenged, and to look behind this Europe shift to the right. Um, we have uh, also indicatively added a few questions that we will be addressing with our panelists. Uh, so the, how have the discourse in the actual policies regarding migration and asylum shifted in the last years? Um, in how far is this part of an overall on an overall shift to the right, what role do fake news play, and how can the latest EU election result be interpreted and dealt with. And I'm happy to be discussing all that and even more, obviously, with Petra Molnar, John Henley, Peggy Adalatian, and Laurent Standard. How this will work is that everybody will have five minutes for an introductory statement, then um, there will be discussion with the panel also including your comments and your ideas from Mentimeter. And then, of course, we will open up uh, the floor to you to start uh, a lively Q&A uh, for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. I come to you first, Petra Molnar, a lawyer and anthropologist specializing in border technologies. She is co-running the Refugee Law Lab at York University in the Migration and Technology Monitor Project. And you're also a faculty associate at uh, Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. I definitely have a book recommendation at this point. Petra just published her first book called The Walls Have Eyes, Survive Migration in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, just last month in May. Congrats on that, and the best of success to your book. Um, I was reading about you and about your work uh, a few days ago, and your research examines indeed how technology is being deployed by governments uh, uh, on the world's most vulnerable people, and also how tricky it is because regulation is usually missing or is not adequate. Um, you also show how borders are big business with defense contractors and tech startups uh, making profit out of that, but I was mainly intrigued reading an, uh, an op-ed you wrote the other day where you say, a dystopian vision turned reality where matters of life and death are determined by algorithms. And this is how I want to start the discussion with you. Can you please briefly outline this very dark reality to us? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Kalimera. It's a real pleasure to be back in Greece, a place I hold very close in my heart. Um, and thank you for that generous introduction. I do have a few images and slides I want to show to illustrate some of the brief points that I'm making. And I also want to shout out two colleagues uh, in the room in particular, Weil Harsifi and Florian Schmitz, who work with me at the Migration Technology Monitor. Um, indeed, I'm a lawyer and an anthropologist, and I've spent the last six years or so trying to understand how migration is changing through the use of new technologies. That includes surveillance, different types of algorithms, um, visa triaging, and anything in between that is impacting the way that people on the move are experiencing their journeys, and how power also operates in society. Slide, please. Um, I've been really lucky to take an interdisciplinary approach to this and also a multi-sided approach, um, trying to uh, understand how these projects play out across different jurisdictions. If we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, so we've worked uh, all over, not just in Europe, and I will draw some comparisons to other places, 
like the occupied Palestinian territories, the US-Mexico border, and East Africa. Slide, please. Um, but really, what I hope to leave you with is the central point, which is that there are people who are at the center of this technological experimentation, which is unregulated, high risk, and harmful. Slide, please. At the US-Mexico border, which is a site where much of this technological uh, experimentation occurs, for me, this is one of the great reminders of just how violent borders are, which is, of course, nothing new to this crowd. Slide, please. This is one of the sites where we can actually physically see some of the infrastructure that is being replicated around the world, such as these fixed AI towers that sweep across the Sonora Desert, creating a deadly surveillance dragnet. Borders are a great testing ground for technology because they are spaces where regulation is already mm -hmm. very limited. They are opaque, they're discretionary, and much of the decision making happens either behind closed doors or in ways that is inscrutable and difficult to understand. So it's not an accident that border technologies are a site to try and understand how state power operates and how people who are on the margins of society are the ones who are consistently caught at the sharpest edges of this. Slide, please. But again, there are costs to this, both to people like Mr. Elias Alvarado, who was a young husband and father who unfortunately died in the Sonora Desert, mere kilometers away from a major highway, um, but also the thousands of people who have passed away, um, of course, making their journeys to Europe. States like to say that smart border technology, again, AI, drones, algorithms, other types of tools, are not only strengthening the border, but they will also deter people from coming. But actually, the opposite is true. What happens is that people who are desperate, of course, will continue moving. But instead, the surveillance is making them take increasingly dangerous routes, leading to increased loss of life. Slide, please. Oh, sorry. That's OK. Um, <laughs> Apologies, I know this photo is not the easiest to look at, but this is, of course, mm. um, might be familiar to many of you in the room. This is from Evros, the land border between Greece and Turkey. And the, this is a cemetery there uh, of largely unmarked graves of people who have passed away making their journeys into Europe. I think it's important to look at images like this because they give us the context in which these yeah. technologies develop. Again, Evros is a major site of surveillance and new experimental projects that are also difficult to unearth. States don't make it easy for us to be able to kind of lift the hood and see what is actually happening uh, in a lot of these spaces because of militarization, um, different secretive private sector contracts, and this kind of growing border industrial complex that is now a multi-billion dollar industry across the world. Slide, please. One last use of technology that I want to highlight again, which is pertinent to this, this crowd in particular, is the carceral use of technology. That is, for example, the tech that we see in refugee camps. This is on the island of Kos. Um, we are seeing the rise of, again, different surveillance, um, even really outlandish projects now, right? Like robo dogs, AI lie detectors, virtual reality glasses that augment, you know, what border guards apparently are supposed to see. Again, in this kind of performance of power and a techno solutionism that has become the norm in this space. Slide, please. But when you actually spend time with people who are on the move, who are caught at the sharpest edges of this um, system you really realize that there is so little conversation being had about centering human dignity. And mm -hmm. this is from the night before the Samos camp opened. I spent some time with a young mom who was facing a forcible transfer into one of these high-tech, open-air prison-type camps. And she typed out this message, if we go there, we will go crazy. I mean, having seen what the camp looks like, it's not hard to imagine why she would say that. Slide, please. But in my brief remaining moments, I just want to broaden it out a little bit um, because the technology is important here, but ultimately a technology, technological analysis is a way to try and understand power, how power operates in society mm -hmm. and how there are massive differentials between those who develop the technology and the communities on which it's repeatedly text tested. And I'll put my lawyer hat on for one second. Um, I'm a reluctant lawyer, but still a lawyer. Um, from a human rights perspective, it's very troubling because currently we don't have a lot of regulation and governance that 
would put certain guardrails in place for border technology. It's an interesting time right now, right, because in the European Union, we now have the European Union's AI Act, which is the first regional attempt to govern artificial intelligence. And you can, you know, if you go into the text, it might seem a bit promising because there is a risk matrix in place that recognizes that certain technologies are high risk. However, when you actually start looking into it, you realize that there are so many derogations and exceptions for border technology. And why is that? Because people on the move, refugees, stateless persons, are once again seen as a threat mm. and something to manage, to make intelligible, knowable, and trackable. So it is no accident that we have very little law. There is the overreach of the private sector that develops so much of this technology and sets the agenda for what we innovate on and why. Mm. Slide, please. I just want to spend the last minute, though, on a little bit more of a forward-looking direction, mm. because this can get very dystopic and very bleak very fast. But I think there is actually a different way. Slide, please. And we can talk more about this uh, perhaps in the Q&A, mm. but I wanted to just quickly highlight a project that we are running called the Migration and Technology Monitor, which started off as an archive and a platform to hold some of this work, but it has actually grown into a community. Slide, please. And last year, we started incubating projects directly by colleagues on the move who are really the experts with lived experience that are sometimes themselves caught at the sharpest edges of technology. And while Harsifi is with us today, uh, hopefully um, you get a chance to talk to him today. Um, but we have five other colleagues joining us this year from Palestine, Sudan, South Africa, Mexico, and, and other places too. There are different ways that we can examine these issues, and part of it is also making space for people with lived experience to be in the driver's seat of these conversations. So I'll leave it at that. Thank yeah. you so much, and I appreciate being here. Thank you so much for leaving us with a more hopeful <laughs> <laughs> message in the end, because I found the, the contrast between the sophisticated sort of technologies you showed us and this ad hoc cemetery um, so striking, I must say, and uh, what you said that the human dignity is the last priority, the last issue that people seem to care about is uh, really worrying, but it's great that uh, there is still hope and there are things that we can do and uh, yeah, hopefully we can discuss more about that, not just now, but also in the second uh, panel that will follow. Um, what you said uh, definitely moves us also to the narrative uh, and how we ended up here, uh, taking as uh, granted in some cases that people are a threat for our societies. And uh, on that note, I come to John. John Henley is the Guardian's Europe correspondent and very experienced observer of European politics. In more than 30 years at the paper, he has been based in Amsterdam, Brussels, Helsinki, London, and twice now again in Paris. And uh, you've reported from almost every EU member state, uh, and as we were discussing yesterday, you tried to connect the dots. To, un to outline, yeah, what are the common issues from all these capitals, and definitely the rise of the far right is one of them, and what makes them so successful. So we were discussing also that migration seems to be also the niche where they start everywhere. Um, but yeah, we would like to hear from you. You published a really excellent piece a few days ago, also on the terminology and the different types, but. The floor to you to tell us more how it looks with the far right now in uh, in Europe. Great. Thank you for being here. Uh, and it's great to be here. And thank you to everybody for coming. Um, so, yeah, I thought um, if we go right back to basics um, and try and define what the far right actually is, what, what far right parties represent, what unites them, uh, what divides them. Um, so... Uh, as Michaela said, I, I've, I've reported from almost every, well, from every European state, um, and almost every European member state, EU member state now has at least one far right party. In several of them, they are in government. Um, so that so they're, they're united by a lot of different things. Uh, they have very different views on on some issues, notably. Um, their relationship to Russia. Um, but there's a lot that unites them. Um, most of Europe's far-right parties are Eurosceptic to one degree or another. They either disagree completely with the whole European project or they want to change it fundamentally uh, and return it to a kind of a Europe of, of 
of nation states. Um, a lot of them are also very, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, a lot of them are particularly very socially conservative. So they promote ideas of duty and patriotism and the traditional family, uh, traditional gender roles, sex relations, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of them are now also very climate skeptic, uh, either kind of rejecting the, uh, the whole notion uh, the, or the science of, of, of climate change uh, or uh, kind of pushing back against what they portray as the kind of unfair sacrifice that, that ordinary people are going to have to make and that the elites will, will not have to make. Um, a lot of them are also now anti-woke to mm. one degree or another, whatever that may mean. Nobody can actually define what it means. Um, and a lot of them are populist. Populism, of course, isn't an ideology. Populism is, is more of an approach uh, to politics, this belief that, you know, politics is basically divided into a, a two, two opposing groups, the kind of pure people versus the, the corrupt elite. And a lot of them apply that political technique uh, to their ideologies. But actually... So they're united by all those things. If you look at um, <clears throat> the absolute core ideologies that define them, the far right, uh, there are two, really. Um, one of them um, is authoritarianism. So almost all, in fact, all far right parties across Europe um, are firm believers in law and order. Um, and you know the, the belief that kind of transgressions must be must be severely punished, uh, clamped down on. You see that very clearly in you know parties like AFD in Germany, the Rassemblement National in in, in France. Um, and but but the, the absolute the the most significant and all all political scientists basically agree on on, on this. The the absolute core. Uh, ideology that, that ultimately defines all of Europe's far-right parties is, is an ideology that, that the political scientists called nativism. Um, nativism is quite simply the belief um, that the, the native group, what, again, whatever that may be, uh, but the native group um, should be the exclusive inhabitants of the nation state. And then anybody who comes from outside the native group, so any, any non-native elements, represent some kind of threat to the sort of homogenous nation state. Um, and that really is the defining uh, far-right ideology. It's, it's the red thread that, that links them all without exception. Um, and that obviously explains why uh, immigration is, is their, their huge, uh, you know, sort of battle cry um, and always has been and, and always will be. Uh, it's this belief in nativism and just, I mean, nativism, you could also say, is, a, is obviously a form of kind of exclusionism. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exclusionary ideology, which explains also why uh, you know, a lot of far-right parties, as well as being exclusionary towards non-native groups, they're exclusionary towards other religions, Muslims, for example, uh, you know, uh, gender differences, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, so that's what really defines them. So that's, that's sort of what are they? Um, where are they? Mm. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're advancing. Uh, the far right parties. I don't. I don't you know, need me to tell you that the far right is advancing across Europe. Uh, they're now in government uh, in Finland, uh, in Italy, in the Netherlands. Leading government in the Netherlands. Uh, leading government in Italy. Uh, a far right party, the Sweden Democrats, is supporting a right wing coalition in Sweden. Um, in two weeks' time. It's really not beyond the bounds of possibility that we'll have a far-right government in France. Uh, sometime in the autumn, uh, we'll have a far-right-led government in Austria. Uh, they're, they're advancing pretty much everywhere. Um, the European elections that we've just had, 
showed an advance uh, by the far right, although not everywhere and not uniformly. I know Laurent's going to talk about this, so I won't go into it in too much detail, but um, I think what we saw and what's particularly alarming um, is maybe not so much the impact of the advance of the far right on uh, the workings of the European Parliament and, and, and the EU as such, but where we're really seeing its threat is in the national capitals, and it particularly uh, in Berlin, mm. um, where you have an already weakened... Uh, basically, the, the rise of the far right, the, the advance of the far right, looks like posing the biggest threat to national leaders who are already quite weakened. So Olaf Scholz in, in, in Berlin is at the head of a kind of very divided uh, and, and fragile coalition that can only have been made more fragile and more divided by the fact that AFD, the German far-right party, collected more votes than every single member of Scholz's coalition mm. uh, and finished second overall. Emmanuel Macron uh, in France um, has been so weakened by the rise of the far right that bizarrely he, he chose to call a, a, a snap general election. And all the polls so far show that the, the national rally, the Rassemblement National in, in France, either will, will may, may, may secure a majority, probably not an outright majority, but will, will massively outscore uh, the party of the, of the president. Um, so that's where they are. Why are they advancing, just very briefly? Um, they're advancing um, because of a kind of a process of, of a, a two-way process of normalization, I think. Um, firstly, many of them, as particularly as they approach power and as they actually enter power, um, many of them tend to moderate their, their most extreme views. At least they moderate the public expression of their most extreme views. So uh, Marine Le Pen, for example, um, having been very heavily defeated uh, in 2017, 2017 French elections, presidential elections, because she was running on a platform of pulling France out of the... on a Frexit platform, pulling pulling France out of the EU, that scared French mm. voters enormously, and that has now completely disappeared. There is no longer any ambition mm. uh, to pull France out of the EU or even the Eurozone. Uh, and you see similar kind of moderations. The parties, you know, mm. Georgia Maloney in Italy, you know, has behaved very sensibly um, as regards the economy, as regards kind of uh, relations with Europe, etc. Et so the parties themselves are sort of moderating, if not their core beliefs, they're at least moderating how they're expressing them. But there's also been a parallel process of normalisation. I think this is absolutely mm. crucial um, on the part of the rest of the political establishment, particularly the traditional parties of, cent of the centre-right, the traditional conservative mm. mainstream centre-right parties across Europe. Um, so in all those countries that I mentioned before, where there are now far-right parties in government, it, it is in coalition with traditional centre-right parties. Um, and that is the core... Uh, there are also, I mean, I, uh, Mayor Culpa as well, uh, <coughs> as a representative of the media, uh, the media has completely normalised uh, the discourse of the far-right as well. My smallest little anecdotal illustration of that is that I, I, I have lived for two, and lived and worked now for two stints in, in, in Paris. Just before I left Paris for the, for the first time, after the first stint, was just after 2002, uh, in the French presidential elections, when Jean-Marie Le Pen, Marine Le Pen's father, uh, knocked the socialist candidate out of the presidential elections. The eventual winner, Jacques Chirac, in 2002, refused point-blank to debate, to mm. have the traditional yeah. debate between the two rounds of the elections, refused to debate Le Pen, uh, we, and, and said, we, I, I do not debate with the extremes. Right? So a couple of years later, I left France. Uh, Twelve years after that, I came back to Paris. I turned on the radio on the first morning, 
um, and on the main France Inter, the main French public radio station, uh, eight o'clock morning program, I, I turned it on and it was Bonjour Marine Le Pen. Uh, so a complete normalization by the media. Um, but so yeah. I think that's the, you know, that's, the, yeah. that's the, the core of it. And that is why, alarmingly, for everybody who's concerned about immigration, um, that, that, that is why uh, thing, these parties have been, the, the, the far right discourse is winning. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely won on immigration. Mm. The far right discourse has won the immigration debate yeah. uh, in Europe uh, for the time being. Hopefully it won't always be like that, but, it, but for the time being it has. And it is also well on the way mm. to winning the climate debate because of the way that centre-right parties, these big mainstream centre-right parties, say the EU in Germany, yeah. etc., are um, prepared to collaborate with the far right. Thanks a lot. One of the things we will be discussing is why they're winning and what we can do uh, from now on. This is one of the questions on Mentimeter. Uh, I must say that the, the point you made about the two-way normalization is also relevant for Greece, uh, where you have indeed a weakened government and you have three parties of the far right represented in uh, the national parliament. Now they managed to secure seats in the European parliament. So slowly we're getting there uh, in different terms maybe, but it's uh, also relevant what you described here, also what you said about the media. And I'm really sorry about your nightmare to arrive and turn on the radio <laughs> in Paris. Is indeed increasingly the reality in France is like living in a Michel Welbeck book or something. <laughs> Anyway, you mentioned Berlin, and like this, um, I want to move over to Pega, Pega Dalatian from Germany, from Berlin. She has been the deputy chairwoman of uh, the, the Grüne, as we call them, the Alliance 90, the Greens, the German Greens, since February 2022. And she's, of course, uh, a passionate advocate for uh, global justice, feminist foreign policy, and human rights. As a German, Iranian, and a committed European, uh, she aims to shape green politics on a European international level, and she is also, I find it particularly interesting, the first diversity policy spokesperson for the Greens. Um, you have made it sort of your mission, Pega, to make also the party structures more inclusive. Uh, this is definitely something I want to hear more from you, but uh, what John described uh, is indeed particularly relevant, is the political reality in Germany. Also after the recent elections, the rise of the AfD, we saw also the map with the division of Germany, and we also experienced, and you more so, even violent attacks, physical attacks, uh, from this uh, political spectrum towards parties that represent the values of respecting the human rights and so on. So I want to come over to you to tell us more what is happening in Germany. Yes, good morning. Um, thank you very much for this very important conference and thank you for having me on this panel and really important discussion. Uh, for my statement, I brought four points for short thesis. Um, the first one is that the space for civic, uh, civil society and individuals to act in Germany is narrowing. Um, you probably know the organization Civicus, which monitors civic space in different countries and has different categories to see how individuals and organizations uh, can act um, politically without fearing repressions. And Germany went last year from open green to narrowing, narrowing light green. Of course, the categories go to closed, which is red, and you know there's a big difference. We're still a resilient democracy, but still it's important to speak about how Germany, how the, the space is narrowing. And one example you just made, or the one thing you said is, for example, really important. In the election campaign, people were not only threatened, they were hidden, they were beaten up. One SPD politician was beaten up in a way that he had to go to a hospital. And even though we say we won't resist, we will stay and fight, the normal human reaction is fear when you, you know, when you get threatened that way. And that already you know, takes away a bit of the space in which you act. And also I visited an organization, a European organization based in Leipzig that protects the rights of journalists. And they also said that especially in East Germany, journalists who report locally are afraid now saying their opinion because they stand there with their names and people know them locally and they get threatened. 
Another problem is that, that the budgetary for civil societies are gonna be cut, which weakens them. And another real problem is that 2019, the status of a nonprofit organization of attack was taken away. With the argument that the definition of nonprofit in Germany doesn't include human rights, defense, and political act. And this is in our coalition agreement that we want to change that and we have to change it immediately because it's really dangerous. Already a CDU um, politician said, you know, questioned if, if demonstration against deportation goes along with non-profit statutes. And something that we're all facing is the criminalization of solidarity. Also in Germany, even though we made it strong in our coalition agreement mm. that sea rescue should not be criminalized, they try to criminalize it and we're really trying, as Germans, trying to stand against it. The second thesis is that Germany is though a very open and liberal country because there is a really interesting book which was published last year by Stefan Mao and some other sociologists, Trigger Points it's called. And they wanted to see if the German society is polarized like the United States. And they figured out that in the topics like migration, climate change, or LGBTIQ rights, there's actually an open liberal opinion and there is, um, you know, the, the people have a consent. But they observe people in discussions and they realize that there's trigger points. And they summarize it in four categories. For example, when you feel like you're losing control or there's something unjustified or you get, you know, you know, those are two points out of four. So, you know, like I've seen two times how in Germany we got in a lot of refugees and there was so much solidarity and sympathy and they turned it around focusing on um, you know, there were some real problems, but the, the far right and the conservatives constantly focused on chaos, on fear, and they repeated that, repeated that until the whole society's attitude turned around towards it. So that's also important how, how right-wing people play with the emotions of people. The third thing is that, especially us who are progressive left, have to really take seriously how the right wing is organized internationally. I was in Poland and Warsaw and I met the wonderful author and journalist um, Klementina Sonashov and she wrote the book, It's War. And she describes really good how the right wing is organized, how they work on disinformation campaign, how they're attacking women human and minority rights, undermining and democracy. But she also describes how in Poland, women organized themselves against it and were able to do something. So, you know, we all have to wake up on this issue. And my last issue, fourth issue is that we need to get the issue of distributional justice on the agenda again. I think through the 90s, the disappointment with with the social democrats in a third way did a lot of harm because since then we're not able to get that on the agenda again. Like in this um, election, a lot of workers voted for the AfD. And when I was campaigning on the streets, the ones that were willing to speak to me said, you're not gonna do anything about our problem, about inflation, mm. about our cost of living. And you know, I'm agreeing, I was like, okay, this is on camera, I'm really sorry. But I, I, I was, well, why don't you vote for the left? And they're like, they don't have any power, they're not gonna do anything. So there's a complete disillusion of mm -hmm. that this situation is gonna change. Yeah. And that's why we need to get that issue on the agenda again. So these are four points, and, uh, but I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Pega, for all these four points. Uh, indeed, space for civil society in Germany is shrinking, you said, but still it's a very open liberal country. Uh, you invite us to think about how the right wing is organized internationally, and the four point, definitely something to discuss. We were discussing also informally yesterday uh, the issue of distributional justice, uh, how do you deal with intergenerational injustice, and so on and so forth. Thanks a lot for all the, the inputs. And uh, last but not least, uh, I come to Laurent, Laurent Standard from Brussels. Uh, Laurent is 
um, the political director of the Green European Foundation. Uh, he has been also political director of the Belgian Green Party, ECOLO, uh, during uh, the period of 2019 to 22, and also editor-in-chief of the Green European Journal uh, for four years, from four, uh, 15 to 19. Um, you have studied anthropology. <laughs> We're discussing that an anthropologist is hidden everywhere, as Petra said, in LSE in London, economics in Brussels and ethics at UCL in Belgium. Uh, and yeah, a very important point in your CV, father of great Lena. <laughs> I, I must mention that. But I also want to, uh, you to help us zoom out a bit. Uh, we had the European elections, so we've heard from the global borders, from all over Europe now, from Germany. You follow closely the reality in Brussels, and um, we had the European elections recently. The final results are not there yet, there is a lot of negotiation, and some of the points uh, of this negotiation are quite alarming. What comes on the table of negotiation, even issues like rule of law, for a seat, uh, one of the top seats of the EU institutions, but you follow all these issues closely and we're very happy that you're here and we can hear from you directly. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here and close the circle of anthropologists. <laughs> um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I have the great honor to be the last one and yet to cover the, the biggest <laughs> territory by talking about the EU overall. So I, I'll, uh, I'll go into uh, um, an image of uh, the tech since we started with tech. So I'll, I'll zoom out like a satellite and then I'll, I'll, come, I'll come in and zoom in and uh, end up here in, uh, in Greece. Um, the first thing by zooming out, I'll zoom out in time and geographically, I think, uh, in complementarity to, to, to my co-panelists, I, um, I want to look back to 2000, 2020. Uh, we have just lived two decades of a constant decline of the progressives. That's a fact overall in Europe, but elsewhere uh, uh, indeed. Should we blame it on the third way and others? That's, that's, uh, that's for another discussion, but it's a fact. Uh, the decline in trade unions uh, and at least in social dialogues uh, all over, including at the EU level, um, has, been, uh, has been one of the, the, the features of this, uh, these last years. We have also, all the way from uh, the attacks on the World Trade Center to, to nowadays, we have a new, you know, we have two decades of characterizing the other, uh, as you call it, and we have internalized it even more so. Mm. Uh, and I think in Europe it has, it has now come to another level of who is the other. And uh, as John uh, touched upon it, the far right is, is building on that with nativism and with this, with this uh, char characterization of the other, not as the faraway terrorist or whatsoever, but in-house. Yeah. Uh, and that, I think, has been a big change. And people like, uh, I mean, they work very differently, but people like Orban, Le Pen, and so on, have been working on this dichotomy that seems to us right now uh, quite trivial, but this Le Pen back then called it the, in French she said mondialist, so the globalist versus the patriots, the nativist versus the, 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 the ones out there, the cosmopolitans and so on. Seems trivial to us, you, but that has been shaping very much the debate, and so um, I'm not sure they won, I would disagree with John, they, I don't think they won the debate, but they won the narrative, which mm -hmm. is, you know, if, it, if there was a debate, uh, maybe they would lose, but they have certainly won the, the, the narrative. I think the, those last 20 years have been further, uh, you know, that, that, that decline of the progressive has been further compounded by geopolitics. Uh, you know, we, 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 because of technology, we're, we're literally bombarded by news and so on. But if you, if you take a step back, uh, we just lived the last 20 years of, a, you know, a reverse of the westernization. So we have the BRICS, we have an emergence, and that's for the better, uh, in my view, uh, of um, alternative models, and I'm not a fan of the global south, but we have a change uh, that has shaped also the way we see ourselves in Europe and is internalized. Yeah. Uh, you know, you go from uh, a colonial Europe that can therefore pride itself and project itself with power and therefore has a different mirror, as you called it, Michaelis, on, on migration. Whereas now, as it is declining, it has changed that mirror onto the other and therefore by an exclusionary uh, uh, um, you know, method. Then we come, fast forward, to, uh, to, to Trump. 
uh, to it's an it's it's an interesting era. It's um, the, the French philosopher used to call it uh, um, you know the 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 green versus brown, um, and I do tend to agree. I mean the first move of Trump before even looking at the Mexican wall that he uh, border wall that he intended to do was to kill the the Paris Agreement, right? So yeah. get out of the Paris Agreement uh, on on climate change. That was the first thing because it was a symbol for yeah. him of that move towards you know, a comprehension of a more open but also collaborative uh, uh, international space because you can't achieve, you know, and climate change has no border, blah, 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 blah. You can't do that if you are, if you are in a in sort of multilateral, open, interconnected uh, um, uh, space. The, the other thing that you see in the last 20 years, and that's very important for what is happening right now, especially here in Greece, but elsewhere, is the rise of the executive. Mm -hmm. The parliamentarism mm -hmm. has really, really gone down over 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 time. Uh, it's it's it, it's down to a sort of puppet shows in some countries, uh, and that's really important. And at the EU level, you see it as well. The council is the is really the powerhouse. Uh, you know, the parliament is really an interesting place. It's an important place. We have gained more and more powers, and as you know, as Greens, we've been defending them. But the council is what what yeah. makes the what makes the agenda, and there it's even worse in terms of the colors uh, of far right and uh, right representation um, uh, in terms of the heads of state. So, again, 2000, uh, the, uh, 2000 2001. Fast forward to 2019. There you you are 2019 2020. You are in a, in a you know pre-COVID area with some tensions. You have people marching on the capital, but you also have a, a, a hopeful sort of green wave in uh, in Europe. You you just lived through a Wirtschaftendas in 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 Germany. Yeah. Uh, yet with what was you know coined as the refugee crisis. So you have a, you have this world. And then you arrive uh, into what we have just uh, noticed uh, now with the European elections, the 2019-2024. These are really, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, fast-forward transition years. Five years, COVID, Trump, Biden, but with a radicalization of societies. You have changes elsewhere, uh, you know, uh, with Bolsonaro and so on in, uh, in South America. And you have the, the the invasion of Ukraine, and not the, not the least, the 7th of October in the in the Gaza Strip. Um, during those years, you have um, eurobarometers are more or less stable, more or less. I mean, mm. people still care for climate. People, uh, you know, do care for the cost of living and so on. But the instrumentalization, and that's where I very much agree with Pega, of of the other and of migration and of the sense that we have, and I'll come back to the key question of this, uh, of this conference, democracy under pressure, that we, we, democracy is slipping away from us, that instills fear and insecurity, a sentiment of, you know, we're not in control of this, and who will give us control? And that's where the narrative comes back to, uh, um, to, this, uh, to, to the far right. And I think the worst thing that has happened in the last five years and has really crystallized in the European campaign for the European elections is all the way from what your Ursula von der Leyen made as a European way of life mm -hmm. commissioner mm -hmm. to this Euro whiteness. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that the Euro whiteness has really become sort of a, 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 a mantra that's spread all over uh, the place and during the European campaign and for the, the elections of the European uh, Parliament, you notice a shift of the right and what we used to call the you know, mainstream center right towards oh, the right. So that's, that's I think, uh, very important. You, you asked me to cover um, uh, the European elections. Uh, 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 Just let me um, give me a minute to ask my colleagues to also, yeah. So thank the you. latest version yeah, of you. the results, where we stand with the distribution of the, the seats. Yeah, that's the very latest, unfortunately. Um, and so we, we came to this uh, to these elections. I'll, I'll try to make it very very brief, but still covering the European Parliament elections. Uh, we came to these elections with that sort of uh, big picture. So 2024, uh, we have questions of security. We have there's no question of, uh, you know, <laughs> I've seen heroes uh, in the last two days. I mean, all of you and that I hear in the workshops, I mean, you know, I, I'm no expert, but I mean, we don't have 
a problem. We have a problem in Greece, for sure, because of the lack of solidarity at European level. We don't have a problem with migration. It has been made a problem again, and very well instrumentalized. You haven't heard about it until more or less November 2023, and then it's back. And it's back on the agenda, everyone knows. You, put, you push that button, the trigger is on, and it works. It works, and then you have the right, and you have a Spitzenkandidat like von der Leyen that has to position herself uh, against it. The results of the election, as, as, um, as John said, are worse in the capitals, uh, in the capitals of some member states, than in the European parliaments. So I'm, being, I'm going to be a bit, a bit controversial, but it's not as bad as we thought. It's terrible, believe me, but it's not as bad as we thought. What do I mean? We were expecting, look at all the analysis pre-election, very serious people, you know, a, a, a wave, and some were even predicting that the, you know, the ECR, which is European Conservatives and Reformists, and the ID were uh, the Rassemblement National of um, uh, Identity and Democracy of Rassemblement National of Marine Le Pen sits, that they were going to be close to half of the, of the chamber. That's, I mean, it was very serious analysis and the polls were, that's not the case. The European Parliament elections of the transnational democracy have worked. We have received the results. There were irregularities, but they were minor uh, compared to you know, most of national uh, uh, elections. It's not a far-right European Parliament, uh, but when you have Ursula von der Leyen coming on the stage right after and saying the center holds, which is a famous sentence, it is obviously completely fallacious. No, the center doesn't hold. It has entirely shifted to the right. The decline of the progressives is now confirmed in ways that are more structural than even in the past. Yeah. And that's the scary part. Uh, and a few days ago, we had the confirmation that ECR, which is the group where the party uh, Fratelli d'Italia um, of, um, of Meloni sits, uh, is now the third party, which is going to be complicating even further the negotiations on top jobs, but you know, everyone focuses on top jobs, but the agenda, the next agenda of the, of the commission. Uh, I think what is most worrying and relating to what John was saying is that the Europe of nations behind the European Parliament elections is winning or gaining ground. And that's the real worry, mm -hmm. is that not only the, the right has taken uh, on board language around uh, uh, you know, migration and the other and so on, but it has taken on board the fact that you know, the European project is a European, of, uh, a European project of member states, we'll have to compose with that. And so that's, uh, that's a worrying, uh, certainly a, a worrying part. Um, overall, during the campaign, the, the European Green Deal was attacked but you had very varied scenes uh, throughout Europe. Sometimes it was security, sometimes it was migration. Um, I know I have to finish. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you got my body yeah, yeah, yeah. language. And so, what, uh, to finish on, on, on democracy and the, the major question, I, I would also uh, go into, uh, venture into some, uh, some thesis. I, I'm not so sure about uh, uh, the, some of the definitions of the far right. I, I think, the problem is that Orban has won on one key thing, that democracy needs to be substantial to be really called democracy. But the democracy of the far right or the right wing uh, um, um, extremist in Europe is a majoritarian democracy. So it's an exclusionary by, by, you know, by design. It's like, you know, we got 51%, yeah. we are the Euro whites, you get out. And so that has won, and then you attack the media then, you know, as, as uh, Meloni does in Italy and so on and so forth. And so that, I think, on, um, on the European scale level, uh, it has been, uh, it has been uh, uh, showing. And then the last thing is indeed, and uh, you, you have said it, Pega, we haven't studied at all from the progressive side, Bannon. I mean, Bannon came here. Bannon came here. The first thing he did, he went to Budapest. And this is where you know the, the consolidation of a strategy happened, and we have been very very weak in uh, in responding to that, and we are even so weaker that you know we are here in Greece, and this is probably one of the key example of the silent, very silent progression of far right. I mean, this is an EPP head of state, EPP being the the European People's Party, so. Uh, so-called uh, conservative and Christian Democrat, uh, absolutely, you know, 
killing rule of law, media freedom, it being the sort of forefront of tech trials on border controls and so on. And so I think this is, uh, this is one of the places where we will need to, to start and start analyzing. So on the next steps, it will be for questions and what we could do. But, you know, this is the birthplace of democracy. So maybe as an opposition to, uh, well. to what Mr. Horban has said as uh, make Europe great again, this is the new slogan of his uh, Hungarian presidency, maybe we can make Europe Greek again. Oh, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> well, not sure if I'm ready for this, <laughs> I must say. But um, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot for fitting so much in this initial statement. Thank you all very much for this generous portion of Food for Thought. Um, now to your first statements. Um, uh, I promise that uh, this should be uh, as interactive as possible and uh, you've heard a lot of things, different points of view and we want to ask you a few things and yeah, I invite you to grab your mobile phones again uh, in your hands. You know how it works now, it's the same instruction. If you kept your uh, browser open then you see the question. You join menti.com and you use the code you see on the screen and the question to you is one of the points that were discussed already. Uh, the far right is winning the migration debate or narrative, as you said. We don't uh, necessarily stick to the word debate because they are more... The first response is strategic. So we, the, the point here is that we try to gather uh, briefly what you think is making them so effective when it comes to defining uh, the migration narrative at European level. You say coming from a working class background, People recognize themselves uh, because we are coward, because they are more aggressive or evil, <laughs> populist, united, emotional, organized, that was mentioned also internationally, very important point. They managed to construct a narrative blame of the other, that was also something that we heard in this uh, discussion supported by the media, or at least, uh, as John said, is part of this normalization that is taking place. They're better storytellers, oh dear God. They're more active than us. They're good at stirring fear or using people's fear, yeah, which is pretty much the same, or exploiting the popular disbelief that was also mentioned. Again, united, um, organized, yes, better with social media, also def definitely a key point or are telling a story of solutions, uh, in quotation marks, yeah, fake solutions or promises. Uh, again, communication and uh, social media. We have 42 responses so far. They're pragmatic. Well, you can see it like this as well, maybe. Um, built on the safety of the past, yeah, well, no forward-looking. Uh, again, uh, lack of good counter-narrative. That's definitely something to discuss. And I give you a few more seconds for the last ones. They're less elitist in their discussion. So the other side is maybe elitist in their... Maybe you can keep the points because then I will come to you and you will have the chance to also comment on what you hear from the room. Uh, again, organized. They don't spend time on the theory of change. That's an interesting one. <laughs> maybe we spend too much time on the theory of change. <laughs> Because they're, yeah, better at simplifying things for sure, and they are not self-referential. Well, not sure about that, I must say. But uh, thanks a lot. That was a very interesting one. And then we have one more before we continue. Uh, it's a different type of question. Uh, yeah, voting in progress. And then if we move to the next one, you will see in line with what we heard from Laurent, um, asking you the European Parliament in the new legislative term that is now starting will. And we give you three options. Um, the first one is that it will still serve as a corrective to council positions uh, to wi uh, that which weaken the rule of law in the EU. The second option is that the uh, European Parliament will be backtracking on issues such as rule of law and democracy in the member states, or which is probably, uh, yeah, the middle ground, have a fragile majority, so it is uncertain to judge its course. 
And so far, this is the trend that we see here already. 13, 14 responses, yeah, say that it's probably too soon to, to judge. And we're probably talking about a very fragile majority. You saw the picture, how it looks uh, at the moment after the first rounds of negotiations. Uh, but yeah, this is probably what most of you here in the room think. Um, yeah, we give you a few more seconds to uh, file in your views. But it seems that, uh, yeah, there is not too much faith that uh, the parliament will still serve as corrective to the council. So what we said that um, the Europe of nations will be winning, um, probably it's also something that you share as a, as a point. Um, but yeah, the trend in the room is that of a fragile majority. So it's uncertain to judge. And maybe we leave it there. Thank you all. And thank you guys in the booth for making it uh, happen. And now back to you. You heard what the, the room thinks about uh, these issues. So I get back to you to react to any of these points that triggered you or any of the other points you heard from your co-panelists because before we get into discussion. Shall we go one after the other? Yeah, maybe I start from Laurent. We, we go the other way around this time. So what triggered you from what you, you saw on the screen? And, uh, well, that, was a lot, that was a lot to take in. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, exactly for the last 20 years, I've heard the word narrative <laughs> a billion times. Uh, we have to work on the narrative, we have to work on the narrative. Uh, I, you know, I'm a very pragmatic person. I don't believe in any narrative that's not in court in social reality. Um, and I think there we have missed big time. Uh, the, and I say we progressives, but obviously I come from the green movement. Um, and it's, it's actually acknowledged on our side. We have missed uh, sort of the, we've not jumped on the bandwagon of talking to trade unions, talking to, um, you know, to people that are organized around the labor movements. Mm. And that has been something which, you know, is, is also a testimony to our history. We are relatively young, sets of parties, 40 years. We were born with Schengen, with neoliberalism, with Europe. Uh, you know, we were not there before. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we are this sort of baby of the knowledge economy, the Barroso years and so on. Uh, so that's a, that's a corrective we have yeah. to apply. And so that, that speaks to, the, to, to our elitism. Uh, I mean, we can... We can speak about our sociology and our own demographics. Uh, this is something we will have to to, to reckon with. Um, just one thing on the last uh, on the last Mentimeter. You know there are more expert people here in the room, uh, colleagues from uh, from the from the Parliament. But for the first time, I see a threat that the European Parliament is not going to pick up the rule of law. Topic. Seriously, mm. you know, uh, as Greens, we've been very much on the ball. The first, very first reporters on um, on on Hungary and Article Seven um, have been from the Greens, Rui Tavares, uh, Judith Argentini, and, and and now with uh, Gwendolyn Del Bosco Field. Uh, this could be, and this yeah. has been a worry, including with the Greek case, which yeah. we have never managed to put on the table, the despite the fact that it's, uh, you know, all indicators are even worse than in any other place. On that, I'm not hopeful. Thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, uh, I come to Pega. I obviously want your take uh, and anything you want to comment, but I also want to add a question to you about the role of the parties, because I know that you're also working a lot in Germany in, within your own party, how parties can become more diverse and more representative of this complex reality out there. Maybe you can also add a few points on that, what kind of work you're doing in the Green German Green Party on top of your comments. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, I, I thought like what also triggered me was narrative and storytelling. I think there was just one comment, you're, you're the better storyteller. Yeah. And are they? Because, you know, I think they're just not playing by the rules. They don't have boundaries. Hmm. They have no problem in lying, using emotions. The AfD, for example, they don't do parliamentarian work. They use the strong resources while other politicians are, you know, working on, on resolutions. They have, like, they use the resources on, on 
completely just to do TikTok and social media. They're not yeah. doing anything else. So you know, it's quite you know, if you, you have the backup of Russia, you have money, and you you're not you're not uh, you're willing to lie, you're willing to instrumentalize to play with the basic emotions of people. So what we're facing here is is people who are not playing by rules. Um, so that makes it a bit bit tough for us, but. Um, at the end, we're really smart too, and we can like also counter this. I'm really, uh, I we just I just think we just have we we slept for too long. We have to wake up and mm. get ourselves organized strategically. And yes, I'm the first diversity spokeswoman of the party, and the idea was that you know you you need representatives. You need uh, like for example people with migration background uh, in politics to have to be a role model, but also to represent. Um, you know, the, the people with migration background. In Germany, we have 27% of the population of a migration background. It's not a small group, so of course they have to be re represented in a parliament, um, but also, you know, they should also act as a role model. But for me, right now, one project that I started with a politician from the SPD is that we want to get the people with migration background gain their trust mm. back you know, because they were disappointed also by the by the politics of the past years, they didn't really change the make make their lives not better, and to you know really empower them and say stand up for yourself, mm -hmm. because it's always like you know AfD sim saying something or you know like the center saying something against migrations, and then other discussing about which what what is what is uh, you know like okay what's not okay, and we need people with migration background to stand up for themselves to stay there and say. I'm a part of the society. I'm defending democracy, and I'm when I say enough is enough. You're not going to sit there and do politics on my back. You know, yeah. like that's that's what we're really trying to do right now. Um, yeah. Mm. So. Thanks a lot. Over to you, John. I mean, I'm sure you were triggered by many of the points, and you already mentioned yourself that they're winning the debate. So I'm wondering what uh, really triggered you from these comments, and also what can we do as an additional question to you? <laughs> That's a vast question. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, for, well, first, I think on the first question, um, I agree completely with Pega um, that we're, we are facing... Uh, people who don't play by the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very happy to lie. I mean, I lived through the whole Brexit campaign in the UK, uh, which was totally that. It was, it was fabrication after fabrication and fear after fear. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think for me, it kind of is summed up by the... or why they're winning, or why they're... one of the many reasons why they're winning... Uh, which which didn't come up it, for me is that is that and that this is because they are willing to lie. Yeah. Uh, basically, they they offer very simple solutions to extremely complex problems, and you know obviously they are not solutions. Self evidently, what they are offering is not a solution, um, but because it appears simple and because it is oversimplified, uh, it cuts through. Uh, that's one reason why they're winning, and the other reason, what you know, what we can, what, it comes back to, to what you were saying, what, what, what we can do about it. And I mean, I think, and again, I think it was Pega who said, it, you know, that, that, that um, so much of this has to do with the, uh, with disillusionment with the, yeah. with, with the, with incumbent governments and with the, with the kind of mainstream governments that we've, that, that, that Europe has had a, 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 since the, in the post-war period, basically. You know, the, I said the far right offers simple solutions to complex problems. I mean, it would be a real help um, yeah. if the mainstream could offer any kind of solution at all. Yeah. Um, and you know that we, until uh, governments start to take seriously issues like housing, yeah. cost of ha the housing crisis, you know, some really fundamental stuff yeah. like that. You know, we, we we have to be able to 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 to. You know, the, the entire the, the, the way the benefit system functions, uh, uh, the, the impact of austeri that austerity programs have had over the, you know, yeah. we, we have the, the fun, the, 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 surely the core duty of, a, of, of any government is to make sure that all its citizens can at least get by, you know, and, and that has not been accomplished uh, yeah. for a lot of people over the last several decades. And so that's one of the reasons why. Why we're getting what we're 
what we're yeah. guessing. And on the last slide, um, whether uh, I kind of agree with the majority view that I, I think it's pretty hard to say what'll uh, ha how the, the Parliament will uh, will will behave. My my fear is that, or my concern is that, although there is a you know a theoretical kind of pro-European mainstream majority in in the Parliament, because of this process of normalisation that I was talking about, yeah. and because, as Laurent was saying, that process of normalisation playing out in, in, in the Parliament has produced this shift to the right uh, in the Parliament. And I think we'll see, you know, ad hoc coalitions forming, so that when, uh, you know, the, 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 the CDU in Germany... Uh, under immense pressure from German car manufacturers to delay uh, the banning of new petrol cars and or you know fossil fuel cars in in in, in the EU, uh, you know if if when when you get issues uh, that uh, the centre right that has moved to the right, uh, when their policy objectives align with the policy objectives of the far right, then I think we will see. You know, we already saw them in the previous parliament, but yeah. you know, we, we'll see many more of them, I think, here. Um, and that could well apply to the Immigration Pact, will certainly apply to a lot of the Green Deal stuff. Um, so I think, you know, although, th although there may be a theoretical majority, um, in practice, I think there'll be, there'll be several, possibly many occasions, where you will find an ad hoc centre-right, far-right majority. Thanks a lot, John. And thank you also for this uh, invitation to go back to basics and provide adequate solutions to fundamental issues because indeed we turned housing, energy and all these very basic things into goods and now that the market doesn't regulate itself, yeah, we seem to be trapped in this uh, there is no alternative narrative which yeah, probably is out of date. Petra, last but not least to you, obviously I would like to hear what triggered you, what you find interesting to comment, and also an additional question maybe because, yeah, you highlighted the, the lack of regulation, so maybe what is needed in these issues that you raised and also at which level, because also when we talk about AI, it becomes increasingly difficult to understand at which level we can regulate and how. Thank you. Maybe I'll start with your second question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think when we think about regulation or any kind of scaffolding on which we can pin responsibility to in areas where just very little law exists. I think we need a multilateral approach. We mm -hmm. need domestic regulation, regional and international regulation, especially when it comes to these emerging areas that are the frontiers of you know, the next set of human rights abuses, which are, they replicate patterns that we already see, but it's also a brand new paradigm and a reality that we desperately need some regulatory conversations around, whether that's mm. a moratorium on certain technologies or even an outright ban. Um, but it's also about bigger questions, right? It's about Absolutely. who gets to decide what yeah. kind of society we live in, in and why and, and what counts as innovation. I mean, it's not an accident that certain powerful actors like the private sector and the state as an entity decides that robodogs are appropriate or AI lie detectors are appropriate and not using AI for the auditing of immigration decisions or rooting out racism at the border. But that's a normative choice that is being made. Yeah. So I think we need this holistic approach to, to this issue for sure. And then pivoting to what stuck with me from these really, really interesting responses is, I actually think we also need to look inward in, in our space, whether mm. we call it the left or, or this you know, migrant justice um, setting that we operate in, and also reflect on how we can better work together and how mm -hmm. we can uphold principles of solidarity. Because there, I, th I think one thing is that, that the right does better is there perhaps is less infighting and less kind of identity politics um, that seem to fuel a lot of the division among yeah. the different groups that we all work in. And not only does that not help the cause <laughs> that we are all very passionate about, but I think it actually distorts the narrative that we are trying to change anyways. So I think we also have to look inward a little bit and, and recognize how we are part of the problem too, you know? And mm. when it comes especially to representation of affected communities and people who are the experts, really, I mean, it requires us to also 
take stock in how much space we take, right? I yeah. mean, myself included, right? I'm building my career on writing about a specific group, which I'm part of too in ways, but you know, I think it's important to query how many resources we take and, and what is it that we're really doing by working in these established ways. I think we can actually build a different world, but it requires some reflexivity um, and perhaps some creative ways of working in a different way. Thanks a lot. So, the floor is yours now. Who wants to go first? I was definitely not expecting yeah, hesitation in this crowd. Yeah, maybe we we'll start with Kirsten there. The mic will find you. Thanks, Michalis. Uh, thanks for the, the very um, challenging inputs. I, I felt triggered by the last uh, uh, conversation on, on discourse, narrative, and so on. Are we losing out, and, and why and how? And it's true, I agree, and it, it really triggers me that when you're saying they are not following the rules. The problem might be that they might make the rules furthermore. And I don't think it's the right answer to, um, to, to a big issue of not finding the right language, as you said, being too elitist, etc. cetera. I, I love, Pega, the way you describe the, the need for more authentic, sort of diverse answers into the, into the space. And uh, I think we have to commonly really reflect more on how do we address people that are, if, if I look back at the, at the nice image on is there a center still or has yeah. the center shifted to the right? This is our societies in Europe. This is not only the European Parliament. So can we get people that are shifting to the right? Can we convince them? Yeah. Is it okay for you if you collect three per round? Yeah. So two more, please. Yeah, next to Kirsten, and then we go on the other side. Hi, I'm Fanny Bihari, I work at the European Parliament. Coming from Hungary, we always got this critique that Orban survived so long because the resilience in the population is not there, there's no democratic whatever habit, people don't participate, and people don't recognize what's actually happening in their country, but I'm not sure anymore if Western European established democracies actually do better. So I wonder how you feel about that, actually, with Brexit experience and all that. So I'm, I'm not sure this statement stands, but I'm wondering what you think. Yeah. We're about here to rethink everything. <laughs> On the other side, please, the final question of this first round, and then we come for the first round of responses to you guys. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Omar. I'm from the um, Foundation Office in Istanbul. And my question is to you, um, Pega, and maybe minorly to Laurent as well. That is Germany-specific one. East and West Germany, like after the elections particularly, there was those maps on Twitter that I saw where like, you know, the number of mosques is less in <laughs> Eastern Germany versus other parts of Germany, less immigrants in Eastern Germany compared to other parts of Germany and yet the far right dominated East Germany. So if it is not a matter of visibility and exposure to immigrants or like, you know, the enemy, quote unquote, why do we still have this political divide after unification in the 90s? What's, what's failing there in Germany for the far right to have that strong hold in that particular part of Germany? Thank you. I know that these questions and comments do not exactly call for a short answer, but I want to kindly ask you to be brief also from your side so that we get as many questions as possible. And I start with you, Pega, maybe, and then we go to the rest. Well, it's, uh, of course, you always have to think about how you, uh, which language you use. That's that's not the point. Um, but the the only solution of all problems is migration asylum right now. Like. Even the CDU, is there any vision they have? Is there any other project they have? Any other answer they have? They don't. So um, what we need is, a, is the battle of coming back to, to say, these are the problems, these are solutions. Like, 
Um, Thomas Piketty says, if you um, don't invest in the infrastructure and you have an artificial shortage, minorities start competing with each other and that's when workers think, okay, uh, it's either me or, or them. And that's why um, language is important, but what is really important is to invest in infrastructure, to have just a short, you know, to, to get, raise taxes, invest, so we don't have these shortcomings for people and invest in housing and, and mm. all, the, all the issues, public transport, yeah. all that. And um, East Germany, yeah, well, you know, where, where, when you have in, in places migrants, there is less, uh, uh, sometimes, yeah, there's, more, there's less um, problems because you actually are friends with, migra with people with a migration background. So maybe that would have helped if there was more people visible in, in East Germany. But the thing is that right now with the rise of AfD, we can't just say it's just an East problem in Germany. It's a German problem yep. right now. There are some more problems in some areas, but it's it's right now it's a whole German problem, and racism is is actually um, raising a whole Germany, un unfortunately. Um, but in East Germany, also to come back to that issue. Um, after like uh, the uni United Germany got united, there was so many mistakes made not to invest in the infrastructure of the East, not to support civil uh, society in, in 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 East Germany, uh, transport, housing, all that they lacked to do that in East Germany properly. So I think you know it, we could have a long debate on what problems are, yeah. but I think these are also some points to to make about East Germany. Thank you, Pega. John, to you. It's the uh, Hungary yes. <laughs> question. Um, and, to, and to offer maybe a, a small um, glimmer of, of optimism. Um, I mean, Poland is the, Poland is the, is the, is the counter-narrative to, to Hungary in, in, in the sense, I think, that Poland... I mean, it's unfortunate that Poland had to go through eight years of, <laughs> of, of uh, uh, law and justice uh, uh, rule. Um, obviously, and I, and I think a lot of people were very unconfident because another th the thing that I didn't, one of the thing that I left off the list of one of the commonalities of uh, of far right parties clearly is that they are illiberal. Uh, many of them are illiberal, and once they get into power, then they will start trying to, and they do. Uh, we saw it very clearly in Hungary and in Poland, and East, now in Slovakia, they start trying to capture the media. Uh, they capture the courts, they start attacking civil society, uh, groups, etc. Um, and so Poland was a, is, a, is, a, is a, I think, a, a, you know, a, a, a sign of hope. Uh, it's unfortunate that it seems that um, sometimes populations have to go through the trauma and the chaos of, of, of realising that, that far-right parties in yeah. government... Um, you know, clear, obviously can't deliver what they promise because it's in exactly the same way as Brexit. You know, if you, if you promise something that is fundamentally unrealisable, uh, the British Prime Minister promises to stop the boats. You know, clearly. That, that is <laughs> simply not possible. And so if you promise that and you fail to deliver it, then you're going to be in, in trouble. But just my little note of optimism is actually that if you... Um, if you actually look at the numbers in the European elections, um, you, you see that the, the, the advance of the far-right parties in the European Parliament, um, it wasn't the spectacular surge, as, as Long said, that many of us feared, or that many polls feared. Um, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, an advance that was completely in line with the trend that has, has been established over the last two decades. Uh, no more, no less. Um, and in fact, most of their advance was due to major progress in three countries, France, Italy, and Germany. Um, and if you look around a lot of the rest of the EU, the far-right par far right parties actually underperformed. They underperformed particularly badly uh, in countries where they are in or supporting government, right? Finland, Sweden, Denmark, even the Netherlands. Netherlands, Wilders... Geert Wilders' Freedom Party, which comprehensively and shockingly, by a shocking degree, won you know, the Dutch elections, Dutch general elections, only in November. Mm. Sure, he got a lot more seats than he did before, but he, didn't, but he was beaten by, by, by a socialist Green 
alliance, you know, which, I, which by his standards certainly would have been a, a you know, a serious un, underperformance. So I think, there's, you know, it's not, the battle isn't lost, is, is what I'm saying. I, uh, my worry is that, yeah, it's, um, you know, I mean, it looks like France is heading that way. France, yeah. France seems to be determined uh, to experience um, a period of, 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 you know, of government, if not led by, but severely, strongly influenced by a far-right party. Uh, you know, one has to hope that it'll come out the other end of it and, and return to sanity, as Britain is now doing. Britain has lived through, uh, you know, since 2016, uh, you know, five prime ministers in six years. I mean, yeah. a, a, a completely... Unre total, total political chaos and instability. Yeah. Um, and it's now returning, 99% certain, to, to a, you know, a, a safe pair of hands and a, and, a, and a moderate, you know, reasonable, not very inspiring, but British voters clearly don't want very inspiring, but they've had enough of inspiring politicians for, for the time being. They want somebody who's pragmatic and gets the job done. Thank you, John. A short reaction from Laurent, maybe, and uh, from you, of course, and then we have our final round of questions. We started after the academic quarter, so we have five more minutes for sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm not always sure where to, s to start, but if you look at... It's always interesting to look at barometers and then compare them with election results. And I think... The one thing, that's why I went back to the two last decades, the one thing that sticks is, and we don't talk about it, and proof is here, we haven't talked about it. Democracy needs to be substantial, you know? I'm, I'm not a, I mean, I, I've been trained Marxist, but I'm not a Marxist, but I mean, you need a, a socioeconomic dimension. Mm -hmm. Inequality has been rising to such extent that the left behind is no more, uh, it's not anymore, sorry, uh, you know, just a fringe, of the society. And so why I'm mentioning barometers, when you ask people what they care for, what they are afraid of, and so on, you won't, most, most of the time, you won't see security un until, as I said earlier, you get to the campaign moment. But you will get cost of living, you will get inequality, you will get a uh, lack of public services. So indeed, the question of uh, reinvesting in our infrastructures and public services is one, but the other dimension that we generally in the progressive camp have been very weak, especially the social democrats in the last two decades, is the question of socioeconomic uh, inequalities. It's, it's just, yeah. you know, I mean, we can talk as long as we want about the formal parts of democracy, but as I said, that's something that the illiberal far-right parties have been very good at playing with. The substantive part of democracy needs yeah. to be uh, worked on, and you know, at the European level, you have huge levers there, uh, and that's why the fight needs to go on there. But so that's that's a, a bit of the the, the kind of um, uh, area that we have left too much on the on, on the side for the, the the you know inclusivity, the campaigning, the narrative uh, question. Uh, sorry, I forgot your name, um, Christina. Kirsten. Yeah. Kirsten. Um, well, I, I, I do agree with you, but I think where the far right has succeeded overall and it has been picked up back by the right is a sense of collective. It's not the collective that we want, but if you look at the progressive camp, it is strongly anchored for the last three, four decades into an atomized, individualistic, uh, societal yeah. uh, narrative. It, it has sort of you know, integrated entirely the market-based uh, uh, ideology. Yeah. And therefore, the way we communicate, we don't want to communicate the same collective as they do. We have our own collective. It's much broader. But we don't project a sense of the, of the collective. And on, on Hungary, yeah, I don't know who said that. Um, but I, 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 I completely, yeah, I would tend to disagree even ex ante, not even now. But it's not that Hungary has less democratic resilience than, uh, in, you know, other Western European uh, democracies. I, I, I don't think so. Quite to the contrary, if you see what the countries, again, in the East and the ones that joined in 2004 have gone through, the mm -hmm. democratic resilience is even, is even bigger. But again, the, the difference between substantive democracy and the formality of democracy, and there you can blame 
the European Union formalism on that uh, is is where is where you know you can play on it, and that's what Orbán did very well. You can play with formal democracy. Yeah. Judging from the questions, uh, you're expecting a very interesting coffee break, guys. But before that, the final round of up to three very short questions, please, so that we can conclude. Hi, thanks. Uh, Thierry Romano from SOS Humanity, risking an unpopular opinion. Isn't it that far right won the migration debate and are going to maybe win the climate change debate because we let them? And shouldn't politics and politicians react? And that's maybe a question to Bega. Mm. Um, react in a sense that while we let AFD and far right a lot of space and a lot of room to construct their ideas and to share their opinions, mm. politicians and politics right now are missing out to deconstruct them publicly and to speak out on the actual problems, to explain them. It's like barely we see politicians explaining what they're struggling with. Yeah emphasizing the civil society to share this problem and this feeling with them to yeah bring politics a bit closer to that and yeah maybe just to, to hear your opinion on, again mm. on that pega would be nice not very unpopular opinion <laughs> um, where was the second one here and then the gentleman in the center thank you <clears throat> um, my name is Alia Russo. I'm representing the Greek Green Institute um, in this Congress. And I consider immigrant myself because I live and work in London for the last 20 years. So um, although I'm a medic and supposedly I'm sort of highly paid and everything, I have experienced the Brexit myself. So I wanted very much to know what are the lessons that Europe has learned from Brexit? <laughs> we are still, um, you know, leaving this. And I have another question, which may sound simple. Why we can't uh, pass across the messages in a simplistic way ourselves? Why would the far uh, right has this privilege? Is this that difficult? Thank you. <laughs> Well, the million dollar question. <laughs> and the gentleman in the center. And like this, we close this Q&A round and thank you very much for your active participation. And apologies to the ones who didn't make it. Uh, hello, my name is Wael Karsifi. I'm with the my, uh, Technology Monitor and I'm a journalist myself. My question is to John because I want uh, to ask you about like your great experience covering elections in Europe. My, my question is specifically about elections because like covering Southeast Asia, which is a far away region from here, there's a trend that we saw there for the past like eight years that far right parties, which gained a lot of ground, they were like the far right party in Malaysia, for example, was the single highest votes. They didn't get in the government because another like practical coalition was made, but one reason is they gained a lot of votes in the past eight years, aside from the fact that they are also, just like you mentioned, are not willing to play by the rules, they are, they are willing to lie and disinform the public. But one another reason is between the elections, far-right parties in Southeast Asia are always willing to be on the ground, talking to people, like we saw them being on the grassroots level, uh, yeah. helping farmers, with, for example, when floods happen, when like there are problems with housing crises, they are always willing to be there on the ground. And my question is, through your coverage of Europe for the past all those years, is there, is there a similar trend? Do you think far-right parties in Europe are good at being close to people, offering practical solutions between elections? Thank you. Many questions addressed to you, John, so I will come to you. Uh, I will give you a final word, but maybe I come uh, to Pega first to react to the first question. Well, there was different, we don't have a common strategy of all parties and politicians. At the beginning, um, well, and, and I used to be a political advisor in the um, parliament of Nordrhein Westfalia, and at the beginning, the strategy was to ignore AfD, not to discuss with AfD. Um, and then for a while, they were not present in the media. And 
you know, there was a while they were going down and the pandemic, and then they suddenly they rise again. And then the second strategy became to explain what they really want and to explain where the problems are. And all these scandals were also published, but it didn't really help, you know, like uh, we were not able to. Um, well, I think, okay, some percent they went down after the big democratic demonstrations, but still, there's, for all the scandals, it's still too high. And you see that also in the United States. I mean, Trump mm. is about to get elected from the jail to the um, to become a president. Hopefully not, but it could be possible. So this is a constant battle. We constantly have to think about how we can reach the people again, you know? like. Especially with with like winning their heads and hearts for real solutions. Like I'm really working on this. Yeah. We, in Germany, we had um, we we raised uh, the welfare money for people who are out of job. And I thought the critic would be, why is it so less money? Why 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 didn't you put enough in it? And somehow the centrist plus the right managed to do this huge debate about why are they getting almost a much, as much money as those who are working in low paid um, jobs. So they were, they were more successful to have a competition between these groups than having the society asking for you know, proper um, loan of people that are working. Yeah. Uh, we, we wanted to have basic child income, social income, for those children in poverty, for them to have um, some, some basic income. And we didn't get the back up to society for this. We just got critic the whole time that the concept that we have on the table is too complex. <laughs> so um, we all who are in the progressive left really have to work hard to get, again, these issues on the table, to have empathy, to have the trust of the people that you know, we can we can do our politics for to, to invest in infrastructure yeah. that is good for everyone, and that that our only issue should not be or or it's not a, a solving problem at all if you have a hard politics on asylum and minorities and migration migrants. But what really worries me that uh, maybe you can say also something about that after Brexit, after people saw that you know when you have no migrants coming in, your problems don't get solved; they get mm -hmm. worse. Um, right now, do you feel like there's an openness for migrants? Because I heard there's a um, group called Migration Zero who even want worse, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll do all three questions, but very briefly. I, yeah, yeah, I think that's, the, that's absolutely the... the uh, I mean, we need to make... I think the left generally has been absolutely terrified of the migration mm. question for far too long. Um, Nobody dares make a positive case for immigration. Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, it, is a, it is a statistical fact in Britain, uh, as, we, as, as we demonstrated, we tried, you know, we worked it out uh, uh, during the whole Brexit debate, that, that, and, it, and it is a statistical fact in most Western European countries that immigrants contribute more to the national economy than they take out in terms of that they pay more into social security than they take out. They tend to be younger, they tend to be working hard, they, you know, they, they, they don't need, they, they, basically they contribute more than, than they take out. And European economies need, well, this is something we haven't touched on at all, U European economies need migration yeah. to maintain the, 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 you know, where, where they are at the moment. And I, the only politician I've heard say that recently was the Spanish Immigration minister, who I think stood, stood up in a couple of weeks ago and said, Spain needs X number of 100,000 migrants per year yeah. to keep the economy going. Um, so, yeah, we have allowed, we, we, we certainly have allowed the, the, the far right to, 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 to win the narrative on, on, yeah. on, on migration. Uh, on Brexit... <laughs> Um, very briefly, John, if you may, if very you may quickly. please. Yes. No, very, very quickly. Um, I mean, I think the one positive that's come out of Brexit is that there is now no single far-right mm. party in Europe that is actively pushing to pull their country out oh. of the European Union in the, in the immediate future because people have seen, uh, you know, quite what extraordinary chaos it, 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 it leads to. You cannot just... 
uh, you know, erect a whole mountain of barriers with, with your biggest single trading partner and expect yeah. it not to have any kind of an impact. Uh, and on, on immigration, the, the, <laughs> the other, th I mean, actually the answer to that question is that um, leaving the European Union um, may have reduced by a factor of six uh, the number of European Union citizens coming into the UK. Yeah but it has led to somewhere between a doubling and a tripling of the number of immigrants coming in from outside <laughs> the European Union. Um, so, it, again, it's this simple solutions to complex... You, you cannot just say, yeah. I am going to stop... We will stop all immigration. It is simply not possible. Um, and finally, the, the question on um, far-right parties. I think it's different in Europe mainly... Uh, because there is, in most, certainly Western European and a lot of Central Eastern, there, there is a, a good, solid safety net, social security safety net, where, yeah. so actually the far right uh, in, involvement is largely rhetorical rather than practical, where you have seen the far right and in, in the Greek, the, actually the extreme right, yeah. uh, the neo-fascist right, for example, Gold, Golden, Golden Dawn, Dawn yeah. um, you know, made huge electoral progress uh, in the during and in the aftermath of the Eurozone crisis, crisis yeah. 2011, 2000, but precisely because they were active in the neighbourhoods and delivering food yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. But in most Western European countries, you know, that the, 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 the degree of practical aid that, that political parties, on the ground aid that political parties can deliver is kind of minimal. Thanks a lot. One final minute to Petra and Loran for anything as a final comment, and then we conclude, please. Just finally, um, yeah, just to reflect about how maybe we can work better in yeah. this space. Again, I think it's about um, thinking creatively and collectively about what is the future that we're building towards, and where do resources go, and how is it possible that we, as you know, being part of this political spectrum, seem to be kind of running behind and. I sometimes think about it this way. It seems like we are we have to be so reactive to so many social problems, but I think we actually maybe can be a bit more proactive in terms yeah. of solidarity building, in terms of identifying issues and finding new narratives that will push us forward. This is also one of the reasons why we wanted to have this kind of meeting here and to co-construct it with other offices, with other organizations, with people like you guys. So yeah, totally see the point. Laurent? Even if you can make it in less than a minute, it would be yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so 30 seconds on, uh, <laughs> on, the, on, on an observation. Very general, but I think it's important. I, I do believe in it. And then on maybe 30 seconds on the next step. And you see, I already wasted them. So <laughs> on, on, on the observation, again, I, coming back to the, the last years and even decades, what we too often forget when you're in a party and you have to design a program and you have to design your narrative and so on, is that we, taken, we have taken for granted that the debates around are about values. The big return in the last two decades of morality in, in, the, in political circles is really where we are losing. Yeah. Morality and values are not the same thing. They can be, they can coincide, but the, the sort of return of a moral order, as you see it, is really what is endangering us. So we need to tackle that, and there are, as I said, points of convergence. The question of solidarity, I mean, we hear it here and something, but I mean, point me to a Green or even a Social Democrat Party that has made it really one of its, uh, you know, uh, forefront uh, campaign uh, uh, um, mantras. It's 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 not a given. On the on the next steps, there are so many things to say. And as I said, uh, most people I have seen yesterday are I consider heroes and heroines. So. Um, let me say about the parties, and I think about the parties, one thing is really the question of the connection on the ground. Yeah. Because I, I agree with John, it's, it's a sort of facade, but what the rights under Bannon and the return of the rights and the far right in Europe has done is a real, uh, is a real parallel to what Reagan did back, back then in the, in, in the US. The Republicans took to the associations, to the famous bowling, club, bowling clubs, and yeah. so on. They went back to the roots. 
we're very far away from the roots. No matter, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to be negative, but I want to be constructive. And we, we need to do yeah. that. And so the dialogue with uh, trade unions and so on. Civil society organizations are key, but they are yeah. not the only thing. Trade unions and associations and local uh, level is really important. Thanks. We'll be discussing more ways ahead in the second panel after the break. I think we provided more than enough problems with our first <laughs> panel here so that you will have enough to discuss <laughs> in the second panel. I want there to summarize everything we said because we have something much better than me repeating things. We have somewhere here, you may see a gentleman drawing uh, quietly on his iPad. Uh, creatively uh, about what we've been discussing. So when you will come back after the coffee break, you will see what our dear colleague Yorgos Constantinou has uh, made with his iPad. He's the man behind the beautiful visual identity of our conference. So I would like to thank <laughs> Yorgos, but uh, also thank Petra, John, Pega, and Laurent for this discussion. 30-minute um, coffee break, and we're back to discuss ways ahead in the second panel. Thank you all very much.